Device 7, page 171. Um, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. By suggesting to the soul his often relapses into the same sin, which formerly he hath pursued with particular sorrow, grief, shame, and tears, and prayed, complained, and resolved against, Say, Satan, thy heart is not right with God. Surely thy estate is not good. Thou dost not flatter thyself to think that ever God will eternally own and embrace such a one as thou art, who complainest against sin, and yet, yet relapses into the same sin, who with tears and groans confesseth thy sin, and yet ever and anon art fallen into the same sin. I confess this is a very sad condition for a soul after he hath obtained mercy and pity from the Lord, after God hath spoken peace and pardoned to him and wiped the tears from his eyes and set him upon his legs to return to folly. Ah, how do relapses lay men open to the greatest afflictions and worst temptations? How do they make the wound to bleed afresh? How do they darken and cloud former assurances and evidences for heaven? How do they put a sword into the hand of conscience to cut and slash the soul? They raise such fears, terrors, horrors, and doubts in the soul that the soul cannot be so frequent in duty as formerly, nor so fervent in duty as formerly, nor so confident in duty as formerly, nor so bold, familiar, and delightful with God in duty as formerly, nor so constant in duty as formerly. They give Satan an advantage to triumph over Christ. They make the work of repentance more difficult. They make a man's life a burden. And they render death to be very terrible unto the soul. Remedy one. The first remedy against this device of Satan is to solemnly consider that there are many scriptures that do clearly evidence a possibility of the saints falling into the same sins whereof they have formerly repented. I will hear, heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them, saith the Lord, by the prophet Hosea, chapter 14. So the prophet Jeremiah speaks, Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep mine anger forever. Turn, O backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, chapter 3. So the psalmists, they turned back and dealt unfaithfully with their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. And no wonder, for though their repentance be never so sincere and sound, yet their graces are but weak and their mortification imperfect in this life. Though by grace they are freed from the dominion of sin and from the damnatory power of every sin, and from the love of all sin, yet grace doth not free them from the seed of any one sin. And therefore it is possible for a soul to fall again and again into the same sin. If the fire be not wholly put out, who would think it impossible that it should catch and burn again and again? Remedy two, the second remedy against this device of Satan, is seriously to consider that God hath nowhere engaged himself by any particular promise, that souls converted and united to Christ shall not fall again and again into the same sin after conversion. I cannot find in the whole book of God where he hath promised any such strength or power against this or that particular sin as that the soul shall, should be forever in this life put out of a possibility of falling again and again to the same sins. And where God hath not a mouth to speak, I must not have a heart to believe. God will graciously pardon those sins to his people that he will not in this life effectually subdue in his people. I would go far to speak with that soul that can show me a promise that when our sorrow and grief hath been so great or so much for this or that sin, that then God will preserve us from ever falling into the same sin. The sight of such a promise would be as life from the dead to many a precious soul 
who desires nothing more than to keep close to Christ and fears nothing more than backsliding from Christ. Remedy three. The third remedy against this device of Satan is seriously to consider that the most renowned and now crowned saints have in the days of their being on earth relapsed into one and the same sin. Lot was twice overcome with wine. John twice worshipped the angel. Abraham did often dissemble and lay his wife open to adultery to save his own life, which some heathens would not have done. That's interesting. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. Genesis 20. David in his wrath was resolved, if ever man was, that he would be the death of Nabal and all his innocent family. And after this he fell into the foul murder of Uriah. Though Christ told his disciples that his kingdom was not of this world, yet again and again and again, three several times, they would needs be on horseback. They would fain be high, great and glorious in this world. Their pride and ambitious humor put them that were but as so many beggars upon striving for preeminence and greatness in the world. When their Lord and Master told them three several times of his sufferings in the world, and of his going out of the world. Jehoshaphat, though a godly man, yet joins affinity with Ahab. Second Chronicles 18. And though he was saved by a miracle, yet soon after he falls into the same sin and joins himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. Second Chronicles 20. Samson is by the spirit of the Lord numbered among the faithful worthies, yet he fell upon often into one gross sin, as is evident, Hebrews 11. Peter, you know, relapsed often, and so did Jonah. And this comes to pass that they may see their own inability to stand, to resist or overcome any temptation or corruptions, Jude 14, 15, 16, that they may be taken off from all false confidences and rest wholly upon God and only upon God and always upon God. And for the praise and honor of the power, wisdom, skill, mercy, and goodness of the physician of our souls that can heal, help, and cure when the disease is most dangerous, when the soul is relapsed and grows worse and worse, and when others say there is no help for him and his God, and when his own heart and hopes are dying. Remedy four. The fourth remedy against this device of Satan is to consider that there are relapses into enormities and there are relapses into infirmities. Now, it is not unusual with God to leave his people frequently to relapse into enormities. For by his spirit and grace, by his smiles and frowns, by his word and rod, he doth usually preserve his people from a frequent relapsing into enormities. Yet, he doth leave his choicest ones frequently to relapse into infirmities. And of his grace, he pardons them in course, as idle words, passion, and vain thoughts. Though gracious souls strive against these, and complain of these, and weep over these, yet the Lord, to keep them humble, leaves them frequently to relapse into these, and the frequent relapses into infirmities shall never be their bane, because they be their burden. Remedy five. The fifth remedy against this device of Satan is to consider that there are involuntary relapses and there are voluntary relapses. Involuntary relapses are when the resolution and full bent of the heart is against sin, when the soul strives with all its might against sin by sighs and groans, by prayers and tears, and yet out of weakness is forced to fall back into sin because there is not spiritual strength enough to overcome. Now, though involuntary relapses must humble us, yet they must never discourage nor defect us. For God will freely and readily pardon those in course. Voluntary relapses are when the soul longs and loves to return to the flesh pots of Egypt, Exodus 16, when it is a pleasure and pastime to a man to return to his old courses, 
Such voluntary relapses speak out the man blinded, hardened, and ripened for ruined. Uh, remedy six. The sixth remedy against this device of Satan is to consider that there is no such power or infinite virtue in the greatest horror or sorrow the soul can be under for sin, nor in the sweetest or choicest discoveries of God's grace and love to the soul, as forever to fence and secure the soul from relapsing into the same sin. Grace is but a created habit that may be prevailed against by the secret, subtle, and strong workings of sin in our hearts. And those discoveries that God makes of his love, beauty, and glory to the soul do not always abide in their freshness and power upon the heart, but by degrees they fade and wear off, and then the soul may return again to folly, as we see in Peter, who after he had a glorious testimony from Christ's own mouth of his blessedness and happiness, labors to prevent Christ from going up to Jerusalem to suffer out of bare slavish fears that he and his fellows could not be secure if his master should be brought to suffer, Matthew 16. And again after this, Christ had him up into the mount and there showed him his beauty and his glory to strengthen him against the hour of temptation that was coming upon him. And yet, soon after he had the honor and happiness of seeing the glory of the Lord, which most of his disciples had not, he basely and most shamefully denies the Lord of glory, thinking by that means to provide for his own safety. And yet again, after Christ had broke his heart with a look of love for his most unlovely dealings and bade them, that were first acquainted with his resurrection to go and tell Peter that he was risen. I say after all this, slavish fears prevail upon him, and he basely dissembles and plays the Jew with the Jews and the Gentile with the Gentiles to do the seducing of Barnabas, Galatians 2. Yet by way of caution, no, it is very rare that God doth leave his beloved ones frequently to relapse into one and the same gross sin. For the law of nature is in arms against gross sins as well as the law of grace, so that a gracious soul, gracious soul cannot, dares not, will not frequently return to gross folly. And God hath made even his dearest ones dearly smart for their relapses as may be seen by his dealings with Samson, Jehoshaphat, and Peter. Ah, Lord, what a hard heart hath that man that can see thee stripping and whipping thy dearest ones for their relapses, and yet making nothing of returning to folly. Device number eight. By persuading them that their estate is not good, their hearts are not upright, their graces are not sound, because... They are so followed, vexed, and tormented with temptations. It is his method first to weary and vex thy soul with temptations, and then to tempt the soul, that surely it is not beloved, because it is so much tempted. And by this stratagem he keeps many precious souls in a sad, doubting, and mourning temper many years, as many of the precious sons of Sion have found by woeful experience. Remedy one, the first remedy against this device of Satan is solemnly to consider that those that have been, have, have been best and most beloved have been most tempted by Satan. Though Satan can never rob a Christian of his crown, yet such is his malice that he will therefore tempt that he may spoil them of their comforts. Such is his enmity to the Father that the nearer and dearer any child is to him, the more will Satan trouble him and vex him with temptations. Christ himself was most near and most dear, most innocent and most excellent, and yet none so much tempted as Christ. David was dearly beloved and yet by Satan tempted to number the people. Job was highly praised by God himself and yet much tempted. Witness those sad things that fell from his mouth, which, when he was wet to the skin. Peter 
was much prized by Christ, witnessed that choice testimony that Christ gave of his faith and happiness, and is showing him his glory in the mount, and that eye of pity that he cast upon him after his fearful fall, and yet tempted by Satan. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail thee not. Paul had the honor of being exalted as high as heaven, and has seen that glory that could not be expressed, and yet he was no sooner stepped out of heaven, but he is buffeted by Satan, lest he should be exalted above measure, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 7. If these that were so really, so gloriously, so eminently beloved of God, if these that have lived in heaven and set their feet upon the stars have been tempted... Let no saints judge themselves not to be beloved because they are tempted. Very good. It is as natural for saints to be tempted that are dearly beloved as it is for the sun to shine or a bird to sing. The eagle complains not of her wings nor the peacock of his train nor the nightingale of her voice because these are natural to them. No more should saints of their temptations because they are natural to them. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6.12. Remedy two, the second remedy against this device of Satan is to consider that all the temptations that befall the saints shall be sanctified to them by a hand of love, Ah, the choice experiences that the saints get of the power of God supporting them, of the wisdom of God directing them. So to handle their spiritual weapons, their graces, as not only to resist, but to overcome. Of the mercy and goodness of the Lord, pardoning and securing them. And therefore saith Paul, I received the messenger of Satan for to buffet me, lest I should be exalted, that lest I should be exalted above measure. Second Corinthians twelve. Twice in that verse he begins with it and ends with it. If he had not been buffeted, who knows how his heart would have been swelled? He might have been carried higher in conceit than before he was in his ecstasy. Temptation is God's school wherein he gives his people the clearest and sweetest discoveries of his love. A school wherein God teaches his people to be more frequent and fervent in duty. When Paul was buffeted, then he prayed thrice, i.e. frequently and fervently. A school wherein God teaches his people to be more tender, meek, and compassionate to other poor, tempted souls than ever. A school wherein God teaches his people to see a greater evil in sin than ever and a greater emptiness in the creature than ever, and a greater need of Christ and free grace than ever, a school wherein God will teach his people that all temptations are but his goldsmiths, by which he will try and refine and make his people more bright and glorious. The issue of all temptations shall be to the good of the saints, as you may see by the temptations that Adam and Eve and Christ and David and Job and Peter and Paul met with, those hands of power and love that bring light out of darkness, good out of evil, sweet out of bitter, life out of death, heaven out of hell, will bring much sweet and good to his people out of all the temptations that come upon them. Remedy three. The third remedy against this device of Satan is wisely to consider that no temptations do hurt or harm the saints so long as they are resisted by them, and prove the greatest afflictions that can befall them. It is not Satan's tempting, but your assenting, not his enticing, but your yielding that makes temptations hurtful to your soul. If the soul, when it is tempted, resists temptation, and saith with Christ, Get thee behind me, Satan, Matthew 16, and with that young convert, I am not the man I was, or as Luther counsels all men, to answer all temptations with these words, Christianus some, I am a Christian. If a man's temptation be as great as affliction, 
Then is the temptation no sin upon a soul, though it be a trouble upon his mind. When a soul can look the Lord in the face and say, Ah, Lord, I have many outward troubles upon me. I have lost such and such a near mercy and such and such desirable mercies. And yet thou that knowest the heart, thou knowest that all my crosses and losses do not make so many wounds in my soul, nor fetch so many sighs from my heart or tears from my eyes, as those temptations do that Satan uh, follows my soul with. When it is thus with the soul, then temptations are only the soul's trouble. They are not the soul's sin. Satan is a malicious and envious enemy. As his name, uh, names are, so is he. His names are all names of enmity. The accuser, the tempter, the destroyer, the devourer, the envious one. And this malice and envy of his he shows sometimes by tempting men to such sins as are quite contrary to the temperature of their bodies, as he did Vespian and Julian, men of sweet and excellent natures, to be most bloody murderers. And sometimes he shows his malice by tempting men to such things as will bring them no honor nor profit. Fall down and worship me, Matthew 4. He tempts to blasphemy and atheism, the thoughts and first motions whereof cause the heart and flesh to tremble. And sometimes he shows his malice by tempting them to those sins which they have not found their natures prone to and which they abhor in others. Now, if the soul resists these and complains of these and groans and mourns under these and looks up to the Lord Jesus to be delivered from these, then shall they not be put down to the soul's account but to Satan's who shall be so much the more tormented by how much the more the saints have been by him maliciously tempted. Make present and peremptory resistance against Satan's temptations. Bid defiance to the temptation at first sight. It is safe to resist. It is dangerous to dispute. Eve lost herself and her posterity by falling into lists of dispute when she should have resisted and stood upon terms of defiance with Satan. He that would stand in the hour of temptation must plead with Christ. It is written. He that would triumph over temptations must plead still. It is written. Satan is bold and impudent, and if you are not peremptory in your resistance, he will give you fresh onsets. It is your greatest honor and your highest wisdom peremptorily to withstand the beginnings of a temptation, for an after-remedy comes often too late. Mrs. Catherine uh, Bretteridge, once after a great conflict with Satan, said, Reason not with me, I am but a weak woman. If thou hast anything to say, say it to my Christ. He is my advocate, my strength, and my redeemer, and he shall plead for me. Men must not seek to resist Satan's craft with craft, but... By open defiance, he shoots with Satan in his own bow, who thinks by disputing and reasoning to put him off. As soon as a temptation shows its face, say to the temptation, as Ephraim to his idols, Get you hence! What have I any more to do with you? Hosea 14. Oh, I say to the temptation, as David said to the sons of Zeruai, What have I to do with you? Second Samuel 16. You will be too hard for me, he that doth Thus resist temptation shall never be undone by temptations. Make strong and constant resistance against Satan's temptations. Make resistance against temptations by arguments drawn from the honor of God, the love of God, your union and communion with God, and from the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, the kindness of Christ, the intercession of Christ, and the glory of Christ, and from the voice of the Spirit, the counsel of the Spirit, the comforts of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit, the seal of the Spirit, the whisperings of the Spirit, the commands of the Spirit, the assistance of the Spirit, the witness of the Spirit, and from the glory of heaven, the excellency of grace, the beauty of holiness, the worth of the soul, and the vileness of bitterness and evil of sin, the least sin being a greater evil than the greatest temptation in the world. And look that you make constant resistance as well as strong resistance. Be constant in arms. Satan will come on with new temptations when old ones are too weak. In a calm, prepare for a storm. 
The tempter is restless, impudent, and subtle. He will suit his temptations to your constitutions and inclinations. Satan loves to sail with the wind. If your knowledge be weak, he will tempt you to error. If your conscience be tender, he will tempt you to scrupulosity and to much preciseness, as to do nothing but hear, pray, and read. If your conscience be wide and large, he will tempt you to carnal security. If you are bold-spirited, he will tempt you to presumption. If timorous to desperation, if flexible to inconstancy, if proud and stiff to gross folly, therefore still fit for fresh assaults. Make one victory a step to another. When you have overcome a temptation, take heed of unbending your bow and look well to it that your bow be always bent and that it remains in strength. When you have overcome one temptation, you must be ready to enter the list with another as distrust is, in some sense, is the mother of safety, so security is the gate of danger. A man had need to fear this most of all, that he fears not at all. If Satan be always roaring, we should be always a-watching and resisting of him. And certainly he that makes strong and constant resistance of Satan's temptations shall, in the end, get above his temptations. And for the present is secure enough from being ruined by his temptations. For a close of this, remember that it is dangerous to yield to the least sin, to be rid of the greatest temptation, to take this course where as if a man should think to wash himself clean in ink, or as if a man should exchange a light cross made of paper for an iron cross, which is heavy, toilsome, and bloody, the least sin set home upon the conscience will more wound, vex, and oppress the soul than all the temptations in the world can. Therefore, never yield to the least sin to be rid of the greatest temptation. Sidonius Apollinarius uh, relateth how a certain man named Maximus, arriving at the top of honor by indirect means, was the first day very much wearied and fetching a deep sigh, said, Oh, Damocles, how happy do I esteem of thee for having been a king but the space of a dinner. I have been one whole day and can bear it no longer. I will leave you to make the application.